Lecture Fourth of a Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Painter. A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery by Juliet Corson. Lecture Fourth sliced apple pie half a pound of shortening to a pound of flour the shortening to be rubbed into the flour with the hands until it is so thoroughly mixed that it seems like meal but not at all melted or softened then just enough cold water to make a pastry which will roll out roll out the pastry and use it at once to line the pie plates fill the plates with sliced apples or with any fruit or mincemeat. Today I shall use sliced apples. Sprinkle flour over the pastry, and then roll it out and line the plates. Wet the lower crust to make the upper crust stick to it. Cut two or three little slits in the upper crust. Take care not to press the outer edges of the crust together. After the upper crust has been put on the pie, brush it with beaten egg, if you wish it to be glossy when it is done. Then put it in a moderate oven and bake it for three quarters of an hour until you are very sure that the apple is done. You can tell that by trying the apple through the little cuts that you make in the pastry. This morning, in making pastry, you remember that we rolled and folded it a number of times. I simply roll this out once, just enough to get it thin enough to use for my pie. First roll out the pastry and cut off the cover for the top of the pie. Lay it one side and then roll out the rest and use it for the pie as I have already directed. Use greening apples if you can get them. These are table apples. They are not so good for pies for two or three reasons. They will not keep their form when they are baked in the pie and they may not be perfectly tender. These will break and grow very soft as soon as they begin to cook. I might, while I am making our pie, say a little about flour in general use in the family. As a rule, I use what is called pastry flour, best for pie crusts. Pastry flour has more starch in it than ordinary family flour or bread flour. The starch is the interior of the grain. The family flour is the grain ground in tar, only the husk being removed. From grain ground in that way, none of the nutritious elements are removed. You get a greater proportion of gluten and some of the mineral elements of the grain that lie close to the husk. The flour that has an excess of gluten in it will absorb more water than pastry flour, or flour composed chiefly of starch, and it will make a tougher dough either in the form of pie crust or bread than a flour which has the most starch in it it is more nutritious than starchy flour so that if you want tender rather white pastry and bread you must make up your minds to sacrifice some of the nutritious elements of the flour all through the west the flour which is marketed is made i think from the entire wheat and that is more thoroughly good and more nutritious than the so-called choice pastry flour. In the West, you have a better flour than we at the East do, if we depend upon the Eastern mills. There are some very good brands of flour made in New York State, but as a rule, they are not so full of gluten and not so nutritious as the Western flours. Where flour is made from winter wheat, which lies in the ground all winter long, and gathers more of the mineral elements of the soil than spring wheat does, the flour is superior. The pie is now heaped full of sliced apples by using about half a dozen rather small apples. I suppose you think this is a rather extravagant way to make a pie, but you do not need to put so many apples in unless you want to. We want a nice thick pie. This is cinnamon that I am using for flavouring. Put two heaping tablespoonfuls of sugar on top of the apples in the pie. Finally brush the top of the pie, either with beaten egg or with a little sugar and water dissolved, 
and put it in the oven to bake. Bread making. Now take your recipe for bread making. Use the compressed yeast which you buy at the grocery store. For two small loaves of bread or a large pan of biscuit, use a whole cake of yeast. Dissolve the yeast in lukewarm water, a cupful of lukewarm water. Then add enough flour to form a thick batter. That will be about a cupful of flour. A thick batter which will cling to the mixing spoon when you lift the spoon and let a drop fall onto the surface. Cover the bowl with a towel folded several times or a thick cloth so that all the heat can be retained. Then set the bowl somewhere near the fire, in a place not too hot to bear your hand, and let it stand for about half an hour or until the batter is light and foamy. Keep the bowl covered all the time and take care that you do not have it in too hot a place. Do not have it in a place where you cannot bear your hand. After the sponge, as the batter is called, is light and foaming, mix in another cupful of lukewarm water in which a teaspoonful of salt is dissolved. After the second cupful of lukewarm water with a teaspoon of salt dissolved in it, add enough flour to form a dough stiff enough to knead with the hands. Knead the dough on the board for just five minutes. Some good housekeepers would declare that just five minutes kneading is flying in the face of providence in the way of bread making, but I assure you it is enough. That is, it is enough to give you bread of a firm, fine grain, perfectly even in its consistency. It won't be full of large, uneven holes. It will be firm, fine bread. After you have kneaded the bread five minutes, make it up into a little loaf, or two loaves, as you like. Put them in small iron pans, buttered, black iron bread pans, and set them again by the fire, where you can bear your hand, and let the little loaves of dough rise until they are just twice as large as when you put them down. That generally will take about half an hour if the yeast is good. Brush the loaves over the top with a little melted butter, or with a teaspoonful of sugar dissolved in water. Put them in the oven and bake them. The bread is to be baked until you can run a sharp knife or trussing needle in through the thickest part of the loaf without the bread sticking in any way. If the needle or knife comes out clean and bright, the bread is done. It may take from half an hour to an hour to bake the bread. In the stove that I used the first morning over in the other building, I have baked a loaf of bread the size of those I am going to show you, in 11 minutes. I had not realised that bread could be baked thoroughly in so short a time, but one day in Northampton, Massachusetts, one of my class timed the baking of the bread. A loaf of bread of that size was baked in 11 minutes. This same bread dough you can make up in the form of little rolls. I will make part of it up in rolls. Of course you will understand that the smaller the piece of dough, the more rapidly it will rise the second time, and the quicker you will be enabled to bake it. So if you are in a hurry, and want bread baked quickly, you will make it in the form of little rolls. When I make the rolls, I will describe the process. Question. Should bread be baked a long or a short time? Miss Corson. The sooner it can be baked, the better. There is no special object to be gained in the baking of bread except to thoroughly cook the dough. It cannot affect the nutriment of the flour very much whether it takes a longer or a shorter time. The nutriment of the flour might be slightly wasted if it took a very long time. There is no objection to baking bread as quickly as it can be done. Now before I begin to make the pudding, I will answer a question that has been asked about the best yeast and the quick rising of bread. The object of raising bread is simply to make it digestible by separating the mass of the dough. If it is firm and solid, that is, if the bread is heavy, it cannot be easily penetrated by the gastric juice and consequently is indigestible, so that the most healthy bread 
is that which is sufficiently light and porous to allow the gastric juice to penetrate it easily. Only a mechanical operation is required to make the bread light. Now that process, which will most quickly make the bread dough light, is the most desirable. The longer you take to raise bread, the more slowly you raise, the more of the nutriment of the flour you destroy by the process of fermentation that lightens the bread. The yeast combining with water at a certain temperature causes fermentation, and from that fermentation carbonic acid gas is evolved, which forces its way up through the dough and fills it with little bubbles. In other words, makes it light. Now the more quickly you can accomplish that fermentation, or rather lightening of the dough by the formation of little air cells, the more you will preserve the nutriment of the flour. The idea prevails to some extent that if ladies use as much yeast as I have today, the bread will taste of the yeast. It will not if the yeast is fresh. If the yeast is old or sour, it will taste. But you can use as much as I have shown you and not have the bread taste after it is done. You see, my object in using a great deal of yeast, proportionately, is to accomplish the lightening of the dough in a very short time. The best bread that ever was made, or that ever was put on the market, was raised mechanically, without the action of yeast. It was called aerated bread. It was bread dough lightened by a mechanical process. Carbonic acid gas was driven into the dough by machinery after the flour was mixed with salt water, and the bread made was very light and every particle of the nourishment preserved in that way. Question. Do you ever put sugar in bread? Miss Corson. You can put in anything you like. You can put in sugar or milk or anything you like in the bread to vary it. I will use nothing today but yeast, flour, water and salt. This is perfectly plain, wholesome bread. You put milk in bread and it makes it dry quicker. Vienna bread, which is made partly of milk, dries more quickly than any other bread that is made. You can make any variation you like from the recipe I have given you. I have given you a perfectly plain, homemade bread. Question. Do you ever scald the flour for bread? Miss Corson. You can scald the flour if you wish, but you do not accomplish any special purpose by it. In the winter time, if you heat the flour before you mix it with yeast and warm water, you increase the rapidity with which the bread dough rises. Question. How would you make brown bread, ordinary Graham bread? Miss Corson. Use Graham flour. Mix your white flour with it, if it is for Graham bread proper. If it is for Graham gems, use simply Graham flour, water and salt, beaten together. Graham flour, salt and water, beaten together into a form and baked in little buttered tins, is the Graham bread pure and simple of the Grahamites. It is not necessary to knead bread more than once to secure lightness. I have already said that the longer you prolong the process of bread making, the more of the nourishment of the flour you destroy. You will see when the bread is baked today, if we are fortunate in our baking, that the bread is perfectly light and of even grain. Bread and apple pudding. Stale bread cut in slices or small pieces fill a pudding dish of medium size. Only three eggs, or if eggs are very dear, four tablespoonfuls of sugar and a pint of milk, or enough more milk to saturate the bread. If the bread is very stale and dry, you will have to use a pint and a half of milk. Three eggs, a pint of milk, four tablespoons of sugar, will make about a quart of liquid. The custard you pour over the bread, let the custard soak into the bread, then on the top of the pudding put a layer of fruit about an inch thick. You may vary the fruit using sliced apples or dried apples which have been soaked overnight and then stewed tender, dry peaches treated in the same way, or canned peaches, canned pears, 
any fruit you like. In the summer, in berry season, use berries. If the fruit is sour, sprinkle it with sugar. Then put the pudding in the oven and bake it. You can use dried fruit with this pudding, such as raisins or currants, but you put the fruit in through the pudding instead of on top. If you want to make the pudding particularly good, you will separate the white and yolks of the eggs. Mix the yolks of the eggs with the milk and sugar. Save the whites until the pudding is done. In that case, you have to use a little more milk proportionately. Save the whites until the pudding is done, then beat them to a stiff froth and add to it three heaping tablespoons of powdered sugar, very gently mixing them just as I mixed that light omelette yesterday. That makes what is called a meringue. Put the meringue over the top of the pudding after it is done. Run it through the oven for about a minute, just long enough to colour it slightly, and then serve the pudding. If you want the pudding entirely smooth when it is done, you must break the bread up in the custard before you bake it. My way is simply to saturate the bread with the custard. You can beat it if you wish. The pudding will be slightly liquid, like bread pudding, and then the fruit, if it is juicy, makes it still more liquid. And if you add the meringue, that of itself is a sauce. You will notice, as a rule, that I make everything as plain as possible, because I wish to demonstrate that plain dishes cooked with simple and few materials can be very good. Perforated tin pie plates bake very nicely. Of course, you want to take care to have the bottom crust thick enough so that none of the juice from fruit pies will run through. If the oven is very hot on the bottom, it will not do to set a pie on the very bottom. A grating must be used. You will have to use your judgment about baking, watching the pie, and taking care that it does not get burnt. Returning to the bread making, Miss Corson continued. Now I am going to put the second cup of water and flour into the dough. You want to remember, in raising bread, to keep it always at the same temperature until you get it light. It should be set where you can put your hand without burning. Keep the bowl, containing the sponge, just warm. You don't want it anywhere where it will get so hot as to scald the sponge. You can set the bowl in winter over boiling water to keep the temperature equal. A question was asked in regard to rhubarb pie. Miss Corson. Some ladies put the rhubarb raw into the pies when they make rhubarb pies, trusting to its cooking while the crust is baking. Others stew it with sugar before they put it in the pies. When it comes in from the market, it should be cut in little pieces about half an inch long, and the outside, or thin skin, stripped off. It requires a great deal of sugar, whether you put it into the pie uncooked, or you first cook it. It makes an exceedingly nice acid pie. Usually the best way is to stew it first before you put it in the pie. That gives it to you in the form of a pulp. If you put it raw into the pie... To a certain extent, the form is perfect. That is, it retains its little block-like shape after it is cooked. The bread now being ready to knead, Miss Corson recurred to that subject. I will take for the dough three cups of flour, about three heaping cupfuls besides the first one. There was an old adage to the effect that some imaginary substance called elbow grease was necessary in kneading bread. I presume that is another name for force, but there is no special strength necessary. The bread is kneaded for the purpose of entangling a little more air in it, and you accomplish that by folding and refolding it, as I am doing, just using enough flour to keep it from sticking to your hands. In five minutes you will find that you have a rather smooth, soft dough that does not stick to your hands. That is all you want. You will always find perfectly good yeast in any town, or you can make the yeast yourself. Question. If you used twice as much flour, would you use twice as much yeast? Miss Corson. 
If you want to raise the bread quickly, you can increase the quantity of yeast in the same proportion that I have given it to you here today, until you reach as much as six or seven pounds of flour, and then you would not need to use proportionately as much yeast. You could diminish the quantity a little. You see, the object of using plenty of yeast is to get the bread raised quickly. Question. Doesn't homemade yeast make heartier bread than the other? Miss Corson. It makes bread less digestible. It may be heartier in that sense. The Irishman does not like his potatoes quite done. He thinks them heartier when they are somewhat indigestible. There could not be more nutritious or wholesome bread than this quickly raised bread. I have given you several very good reasons for raising bread as quickly as possible. Bread raised more slowly is not so nutritious, because some of the nutritive elements are destroyed in the fermentation, which goes on in the slow process. To make rolls, take small pieces of dough and make them round, and cut them nearly through the centre. Put the rolls in a buttered pan, cover them up with a cloth, and let them rise double their original size, where you can bear your hand. Then bake them. Let the dough always rise until it is twice its size before baking. I think I have already explained to you that if you want the bread or roll glossy, you can brush it with sugar and water or melted butter. These rolls will be set on the top of the stove to rise, just like bread. As soon as they are twice their size, they go into the oven to bake. Question. Do you ever use any shortening in the rolls? Miss Corson. You can use it if you want to. Knead butter in the part of the dough that is designed for rolls, say a tablespoonful of butter. Put it in when you are doing the five minutes kneading. There is no reason why you should not knead in anything that your fancy calls for, providing it is edible. Now I will show you how you can prevent the juice running out of fruit pies. For fruit pies, pies made in the summertime, of juicy fruits, better use no undercrust. Take a deep dish, put the fruit into the dish, heaping it a little, just as I heaped the apples. Wet the edges of the dish with cold water, lay the pastry on the dish, and press it very slightly. Not onto the edge itself, because that makes the pastry heavy, but just inside the edge. As I press it, I leave the edge intact. Press the pastry against the dish all the way round. Then with your finger, make a little groove all the way round your pie, inside the edge of the crust. Then, with a little knife, cut holes in the groove. Now, when the juice of the fruit boils out, as it will, instead of forcing its way out of the edges, the crust will be held upon the wet dish and the fruit juice will boil out into the little groove and stay there. To serve the pie, you cut the upper crust with a sharp knife and serve with a spoon, taking a piece of crust and plenty of fruit out onto each plate. No undercrust is there. If you have an undercrust with very juicy pie, it will be pretty sure to be soggy and heavy. The English way of serving these pies is a very nice one, and is, as I have described, with whipped cream. Serve whipped cream with a fruit pie. Among other nice things that we cannot get in this country is Devonshire cream, which is a cream almost as thick as the hard sauce you make by mixing powdered sugar and egg together. It is thick enough almost to cut. We cannot get that cream here, but use thick, nice cream, sweetened or not, as you like. One of my English friends, who first taught me this way of serving pie, said that at her home they never sweetened the cream. They simply whipped it to a froth and served it piled up on a dish by the side of the pie. The pie was taken out on a plate, and then two or three spoonfuls of the whipped cream laid on the plate by the side of the pie. You can sweeten it if you like. Meringue I will next make a meringue. I have already told you to use the whites of three eggs, three tablespoonfuls of powdered sugar, 
and that really must be pulverized very fine and sifted. In beating the eggs, you can always get them light very quickly, if they are reasonably cold in the beginning, by beating with a change of movement. Beat until your hand grows tired, then simply change the way you hold the beater. Don't stop beating. Of course, you can use any kind of an egg whip you like. This which I use is made of twisted wire. Only take care to have the egg beaten entirely stiff. Do not have any liquid egg in the bottom of the bowl. In the summer time, you can cool the egg by putting in a little pinch of salt if it does not beat stiff at once. I would not advise using an egg that had the least odour about it. As soon as the custard in the pudding is done, we are going to take the pudding out of the oven and put the meringue on the top, whether the apples are done or not. It does not do any harm to stop beating for a while. Mix this using a cutting motion, not a stirring motion. Mix until the sugar and egg are smoothly blended and the meringue is ready to use. End of lecture fourth. Lecture fifth of a course of lectures on the principles of domestic economy and cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jill Preston. A course of lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery by Juliet Corson Lecture 5th Our lesson this morning is cream of salmon, shoulder of lamb, boned and roasted, force meat or stuffing for roast meats, potatoes boiled and baked, and cheese crusts. I shall begin with the lamb or mutton. Remove the bone first, then stuff and bake the meat, as I have no facilities for roasting with this stove. But I will have something to say about the process of roasting in the course of the lesson. A great many of the ladies think that the shoulder or forequarter of meat is not so desirable a piece for use as the loin or hindquarter. But that is a mistake. In the first place, the proportion of bone in the forequarter is very much less than in the hindquarter. In one lesson that I gave about a week ago at Cleveland, I had a butcher remove all the bones from a forequarter weighing between five and six pounds and then weighed the bones. They weighed a pound and a quarter. I also had him remove the bones from the hindquarters and weighed them, and they weighed more. The meat of the forequarter is sweeter and quite as nutritious as the meat of the hindquarter. And the forequarter is always cheaper, so that you see on the score of flavor an economy, the forequarter is more desirable for use than the hindquarter. In England, where mutton is always in perfection, it is the forequarter or shoulder of mutton that is served to guests, and the hindquarter is the one that is used for the family dinner. To make the dish, which I'm going to prepare this morning. I have had the whole quarter brought in so that I can show you how the shoulder should be cut off, simply with a large piece of the outside skin attached. Usually the butcher might cut the shoulder square off close, but I want this large piece of skin for stuffing. There is a natural division between the shoulder and the ribs so that the shoulder comes off with perfect ease. If you buy an entire forequarter like that, you will have the butcher cut off the shoulder for roasting or baking. 
Then let him cut the neck in rather small pieces for stews or mutton broth. What is called the rack or ribs would be cut into chops for broiling or frying, and the breast would be cut off entire to be stewed or roasted or baked. A very nice way to prepare the breast is to have the bones all taken out. Spread a layer of nice force meat or stuffing over it, roll it up, and tie it. Then it can be baked or roasted or stewed. Another nice way to cook the breast is to boil it until it is tender enough to enable you to pull the bones out without any difficulty. Then take out all the bones, put it on a platter, set another platter on top of it with a heavy weight on the top platter and press it until it is cold. Then cut it in rather small pieces, about two or three inches square, and bread and fry it. The process of breading and frying is accomplished in this way. You have cracker crumbs, cracker crumbs rolled and sifted, or bread crumbs, stale bread, dried in the oven and rolled and sifted, in a large dish. In another dish, beat a couple of eggs until they are liquid. It does not need to be frothy but simply to have the substance of the egg well broken. Then dip the little pieces of boiled lamb, first in the cracker dust, then in the beaten egg, then again in the cracker dust. That is called breading. To fry properly, so that you have no grease, you want the frying kettle half full of fat. You don't want a little fat in a frying pan but a frying kettle like that, which you use in frying doughnuts. Put the kettle over the fire and let the fat get hot. That is, let it get so hot that it begins to smoke. When the fat begins to smoke, you plunge whatever article you wish to fry into it. If you take the precaution to do that, have plenty of fat and let it get smoking hot and then fry in it. You will never have anything greasy. The action of the hot fat at once so carbonizes the surface of what you wish to fry and prevents the soaking of the fat. Fry whatever article you are treating until it is a light brown. Then take it out of the fat with a skimmer and lay it on brown paper for a moment. Coarse brown paper. And that will absorb the very little fat on the surface. It will be perfectly free from grease. You can season before you bread an article, or you can season the breadcrumbs or cracker dust, which you use in breading, just as you like. Or, after the article is fried, you can season it with salt and pepper. Some things are seasoned after the frying. For instance, Saratoga potatoes. They are always salted after frying. You can make breadcrumbs very fine by using a fine sieve and sifting. If you have cracker meal already prepared, you will see that it is as fine as Indian meal. It is sold in the grocery stores and at the cracker factories, and it is cheaper to buy cracker dust or cracker meal than it is to make it at home. If you buy the whole crackers because, of course, the manufacturers can afford to use their broken crackers. They are all perfectly good in making cracker meal and sell that very much cheaper than they can sell the whole crackers. The question of the digestibility of fried articles of food is very often raised. You understand that the hard fried surface is less digestible than any soft surface and many fried articles are indigestible because of the quantity of grease they contain. If you fry in the way I have told you, you will not have that excess of grease. To take the bone from the shoulder, first cut from the inside and take out the shoulder blade. Cutting from the inside, avoiding as far as possible cutting through the skin on the outside. 
The butcher will always do this for you, probably, if you tell him about what you want done. First, the shoulder blade is taken out, then the bone, which follows down along the leg. After the shoulder blade is taken out, put it into a kettle of water over the fire and boil it for a while until you can scrape all the meat off of it. You will have to use it in finishing the dish. After taking out the shoulder blade, the cutting must all be done from the inside. There will be two or three places where you may possibly cut through the skin, where it is drawn very close over the bone, but cut as little as possible. When the meat is freshly killed, before the skin is dried, you may not always cut through there, but when the skin is dried fast to the bone, you will have to. This may seem a slight waste of time, but this dish is desirable for several reasons. In the first place, the bone being entirely taken out, you can carve it without any waste whatever and with a great deal of ease. In the next place, it gives you a very ornamental dish. In fact, I'm going to show you how to make a duck out of it. And as I say, if you get the butcher to do it, it will not make any difference to you if it does take time. Always in sewing meat or poultry, ladies, take very large stitches, not with fine thread. Use cord so that you can see where the threads are when the meat is done. Any kind of a large needle will answer for sewing, large enough to carry your cord. Always leave long ends, too. To stuff the meat, season it nicely with pepper and salt and any herb that you're going to use in making stuffing. Sage, of course, would be very good with fat meat. Put onion in the stuffing to make it imitate duck. For a force meat of bread, a teaspoonful of chopped onion, fry it in a tablespoonful of butter until it is light brown. While the onion is frying, soak a cupful of stale bread in cold water until it is soft. Then squeeze out the water. Put the soaked bread with the fried onion. Add a teaspoonful of salt, a teaspoonful of any herb that you decide for seasoning, any dried sweet herb, half a salt spoonful of pepper, and stir all these ingredients over the fire until they are scalding hot. Use that force meat for stuffing any kind of meat or poultry. Of course, there are a great many ways of making force meats. This is only one, and a very simple one. Another good stuffing for duck or for this dish, if you wish, is more closely to imitate duck, would be to increase the quantity of onions. Use much more onion half a cupful of onion, or even more when you want to make onion stuffing. Another way is to use dry bread without cooking, a chopped onion, herbs, butter. Some ladies like to put an egg in stuffing. There are a great many different methods of making it. Cold, chopped meat is very nice added to stuffing or dressing. After the shoulder is stuffed, thus, Run a needle entirely round the edge in a large overhand stitch so that you can draw it up like a purse. Stitches at least an inch and a half long. That draws the edge up. Then take two or three stitches in such a way as to hold the stuffing in. Remember always to leave long ends in tying the cord used in sewing. Then curl the leg up like the neck of a duck, and fasten with a cord. After it is prepared like that, it is to be put into a pan in the oven or before a hot fire and brown quickly on the outside. It may be seasoned after it is browned. There will be a little drippings in the pan. Baste it with the drippings. Bake it or roast it, allowing, if you want it well done, 
about twenty minutes to the pound. A shoulder like that will weigh about two pounds and a half or three pounds. It will do in an hour's time, in a pretty quick oven, in an hour and a half in a moderate one. Use no water in the baking pan, because water never can get as hot as the fat outside of the meat. The temperature of the hot fat is higher than the temperature of hot water, and the result of putting water around meat in a baking pan is to draw out the juice. The object is to keep all the juice in the meat. You will always find that there will be drippings enough for many ordinary cut of meat for the purpose of basting. If you have an absolutely lean piece of meat, pour about a couple of tablespoonfuls of drippings or butter in the baking pan, but no water, and use the drippings for basting. A nice gravy is very easily made from the drippings in the pan. I will tell you about that later. If the meat appears to be baking too quickly, if there is any danger of its burning, put a sheet of buttered paper over it. Baste the meat every 15 or 20 minutes. You can drench it with flour just before basting if you want to. That gives it a rough surface. The flour browns with the fat. If you are basting with water, of course, the flour would not brown so quickly. I think I have given you good reasons for not basting it with water. Cream of Salmon A cupful of boiled salmon, separated from the skin and bone, and rubbed through a sieve with a potato masher, mixed with a quart of cream soup, gives you cream of salmon. Any of the ladies who have seen cream sauce made will understand the making of the cream soup. Put a slice of salmon that will make a cupful over the fire in enough boiling water to cover it with a heaping tablespoonful of salt and boil it until the flakes separate. That will be perhaps 10 minutes. Watch it a little. When the flakes separate, drain it, take away the skin and bones and put it into a fine colander or stout wire sieve and rub it through with a potato masher. Question. Do you use canned salmon? Miss Corson. Yes, you can use canned salmon that is already cooked and you simply would rub it through the sieve. The fresh salmon is to be boiled in salted water. If you use canned salmon, you do not need to boil it. After the salmon is rubbed through the sieve, it is called puree or pulp of salmon. Now to make a quart of cream soup. For each quart of soup, put in the saucepan a heaping tablespoonful of butter, a heaping tablespoonful of flour, Put them over the fire and stir them until they are quite smooth. Then begin to add hot milk, half a cupful at a time. Strain each half cupful smoothly with the butter and flour before you add any more, till you have added a quart. Or if milk is scarce, a pint of milk and a pint of water. If you haven't any milk at all, a quart of water. That gives you a white soup. If you add simply water, if you add milk, it is called cream soup. If you're very fortunate and have lots of cream, in place of some of the milk, use cream and then you will have genuine cream soup. After the milk or water is all added, then season the soup palatably with salt and pepper, white pepper. I have told you about white pepper. It is to be had at all the grocery stores. It costs no more than black pepper and is very much nicer for any white soup or white sauce. Salt and pepper to taste and a very little grated nutmeg. 
a quarter of a salt spoonful, a little pinch of grated nutmeg. After the soup is seasoned, stir in the salmon. I have told you already how to prepare the salmon. Stir the soup constantly until it boils for a couple of minutes. By that time, you will find that the salmon is stirred smoothly all through it. Then it will be ready to serve, and it is very good. You can use any other kind of fish in the same way, and your soup will take its name from the fish that you use, halibut or codfish, trout or any fish. Only remember, if you want the soup to be white, you must use the white part of the fish. For instance, if you had a large dark fish, you would want to take off the brown parts and use only the white parts. Otherwise, the brown parts of the fish will color the soup. You can use cream soup as the basis for vegetable soups that are very nice. Prepare the vegetables in the same way. Boil them and rub them through a sieve with a potato masher. Then stir them into the cream soup. Use asparagus, celery, cucumbers, green peas, string beans, Jerusalem artichokes, those little root artichokes, any vegetable. In fact, varying the quantity of vegetable in this way. You will find that some vegetables will give a much more decided flavor than others. For instance, celery has a very strong flavor, and cucumbers have rather a decided flavor. You want to use enough vegetables to flavor the soup, if it is a white vegetable. If it is a vegetable that is decided color like carrots, for instance, or beets, by the way, beets make a delicious soup and a very pretty one is made with spinach. You want to use enough to color the soup. The beets boiled so that all the color is preserved and then rubbed through a sieve make a very pretty soup. One of our New York pupils call it a pink velvet soup. Spinach makes a very nice green soup if it is properly boiled. We shall try to get some spinach for one of the lessons. We have puree of spinach on our list and if we can get any spinach, I will show you how to boil it so as to keep its color. Boiled Potatoes The boiling of potatoes is a very simple operation, but there is a good deal of talking to be done in connection with it. It does not make any difference whether you use hot water or cold in boiling potatoes. What you want to watch is the stage at which you take the potatoes out of the water. That is what determines whether they are to be mealy or not. The cause of the potatoes being mealy is the rupture of the starch cells and the escape of the steam just at the right moment, just when the potatoes are tender. And if you leave them in the water, after they are tender, then the membrane of the starch cells, being broken, permits the water to penetrate. Even if the skins are not cut or broken, the moisture in the starch cell themselves will condense and make the potato heavy, so that you want to give the steam a chance to escape as soon as the potatoes are tender. If you will do that, you are sure of mealy potatoes provided the potatoes are ripe. Unripe potatoes or new potatoes or sprouted or frosted potatoes you cannot well make mealy because the starch cells in the new potatoes are not fully matured. In the old sprouted potatoes, they are disorganized, especially as the little sprouts take up the nutritive properties which enable them to grow. But if you use ripe potatoes before they are beginning to sprout and pour the water off of them when they are tender and allow the steam to escape, you'll be sure to have the potatoes mealy unless they are watery potatoes. The ordinary market potatoes will be sure to be mealy now you can ensure the escape of the steam by draining the potatoes and covering them with a towel folded several times. 
that is draining off all the water as soon as the potatoes are tender enough to enable you to run a fork through them. Do not wait until they begin to break apart because by that time the starch cells are being broken up and the water will have begun to penetrate to the interior of the potato. After boiling the potatoes, either in cold or hot water, until they are tender, drain them and put a folded towel over them in the saucepan. Set the saucepan on the back part of the stove, where the potatoes cannot burn, or put it up on a brick on the back part of the stove. The potatoes may be peeled or not, as you choose. If you peel the potatoes in the most careful way, that is, cutting the thinnest possible skin off, you will waste at least an ounce in every pound. A very good way to peel potatoes is to take off just a little rim of the skin all around them and boil them. Then, if you want to peel them before they go to the table, it will be easy to strip off the two pieces of skin remaining. In order to save time, I shall put the potatoes into boiling water enough to cover them with a tablespoonful of salt. Take about a quart of water and a tablespoon of salt. I have already said that as soon as the potatoes are tender enough to pierce with a fork, not when they are beginning to break and they are drained, cover them with a cloth and keep them hot as long as you like. In about three or four minutes, after they have been covered with the cloth, they will begin to grow mealy as the steam escapes and you can keep them hot and mealy for three or four hours. It makes very little difference with potatoes, although with some kinds of vegetables it makes a decided difference whether you boil them in hard or soft water. But as a rule, soft water is best for boiling vegetables. You can always soften the water by putting a very little carbonate of soda in it to counteract the extreme hardness of the water which is caused by lime or mineral elements. The hardness of water slightly hardens the surface of vegetables but it has an entirely different action on meats. It slightly hardens the surface not enough to make the vegetables tough by any means but enough to retain all the juices and all the flavors. Do not have the potatoes tightly covered after they are cooked because the steam will condense on the inside of the cover and fall back on the potatoes thus making them watery. In serving potatoes on the table after they are cooked do not put a cover on the dish. Put a folded napkin over the potatoes. Do not put the dish cover on it. It will have the same effect that it would have if you put the cover on the pot. The steam arising would condense and fall back on the potatoes in the form of moisture and make the potatoes watery. In baking potatoes the same general principles apply. That is at the moment when the potatoes are tender. And that of course depends upon the oven in which you bake them. The starch cells are ruptured and the moisture is at the point of escaping if you give it vent by slightly breaking the potato. Then the potatoes will keep mealy for a little while. But baked potatoes deteriorate every moment they stand after they are tender. You should serve baked potatoes just the moment they are done if you want them to be perfect. If you wrap them up in a napkin, it keeps in the steam. The longer they stand, the more of the hard skin forms on them. And if you let them stand for half an hour or more, you find the skin sometimes a sixteenth of an inch thick. You can take a little slice off the end without breaking them to permit the escape of the steam, but serve them just as quick as you can. In sending them to the table, do not put the dish cover on them. Throw a napkin over them to keep the heat in. 
I have found that in baking potatoes, that the hotter the oven, the better the potatoes would be. That is, the more quickly they would be baked. I have been able to bake them sometimes in 20 minutes. To soak potatoes in cold water restores a little of their moisture that may have been lost by the natural evaporation. For instance, late in the winter you will find potatoes slightly shriveled. That is caused by the escape of the moisture. If you had weighed them in the fall and weighed them again at that time, you would find they weighed less. To soak them for an hour or more before you cook them is to restore that wasted water and to increase the substance of the potato. There is very little nutriment lost in the waste of the moisture. It is only the bulk of the potato. You do not need to salt the water in which the potatoes are soaked. The only effect of salting water would be to make it colder. In soaking green vegetables, it is well to salt the water because if there are any insects in the vegetables, they are killed by the action of the salt. In lettuce or cabbage or cauliflower, there are insects that hide away among the leaves and salt kills them. In regard to the soaking of the green vegetables, of course, directly, the insects are dead. They naturally fall off their own weight from among the leaves. But if the leaves are closely packed, as sometimes they are in cabbage or lettuce, you want to hold the vegetable by the root and turn it up, and with your hands, separate the leaves without tearing. If lettuce is used, take care not to tear them. If cauliflower is being washed, take hold of the root and shake it well through the water so that the motion will dislodge the little creatures. Cheese crust. For cheese crust, use bread that is a day or two old. Baker's bread or homemade bread. Baker's bread is the best for toast of all kinds, and this is sort of toast. Cut the bread in even slices, rather small, cutting off the crust. There's no waste in doing that, for I have already told you how to use up pieces of stale bread by making them into crumbs. Grate some cheese so that you have a tablespoonful of cheese for each little slice of bread. On each of the little pieces of bread, put a tablespoonful of the grated cheese, a very little dust of pepper and salt, and a small piece of butter, not larger than a white dried bean. Put the pieces of bread in a pan. Set the pan in a rather quick oven, and just brown the cheese crust. If the oven is in a good condition, it will toast the bread and brown the cheese in about 10 minutes, or even less. They are very good, those little cheese crusts. You can use them either hot or cold. They are a very nice supper dish. They are very good with salad at dinner, with any green salad. Of course, if you serve them hot, the cheese is a little more tender. Any kind of cheese will answer for making the crusts. I think that the ordinary American factory cheese is about as good as any other cheese. You do not want a rich, expensive cheese for cheese crusts. At this point, the stuffed shoulder of mutton was brought forth, done, the fan-shaped shoulder blade being stuck in to represent the tail of the duck, which the whole dish strongly resembled. Gravy for meat. There are about two tablespoonfuls of drippings in the pan. I'm going to put a heaping tablespoonful of flour with it and stir it until it is brown. Then I'm going to stir in gradually about a pint of boiling water and season it with salt and pepper. And then I will send it down and show it to you. Make gravy in this way for any Baked Meat End of Lecture Fifth
Recording by Jill Preston. Lecture sixth of A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery by Juliet Corson. Lecture sixth our first dish this afternoon ladies will be roast chicken the lesson will include fish and poultry first to choose a tender chicken examine the tip end of the breastbone the lower end of the breastbone to see if it is soft if it bends without breaking under pressure in other words if the cartilage has not hardened into bone you may be sure that the chicken is young and consequently probably tender the market people have a favorite way of showing you that the chicken is tender by taking hold of the wing and giving the joint a twist they say you see how tender it is but that is no test except of strength but there is no ingenuity which can simulate that soft cartilage on the end of the breastbone that is always a sure test after choosing the chicken of course now i am speaking of dressed chicken or chickens that are killed after choosing the chicken have it carefully picked and singed then if it is undrawn wipe it with a wet towel and proceed to draw it carefully without breaking the intestines if it is drawn already the chances are that it will be imperfectly drawn and you will have to wash it there is the disadvantage of having poultry drawn before it goes to the market because where people draw poultry in large quantities they are very apt to do it carelessly in that case it is necessary to wash it but if you draw it carefully yourself you will not have to do that by washing you of course take away the flavor as i told you the other day because you lose more or less of the blood cut the skin of the back of the neck and take out the crop then cut off the neck close to the body that leaves the skin so that you can draw it up and fasten it back if this chicken was not already cut for drawing i should cut it at one side under one of the legs so that when i came to sew it up and dress it i could hide the cut you can always tell by looking at the chicken whether the entrails are broken and whether it needs washing after you have drawn the chicken very carefully separate the gall from the liver the gall is that little greenish bag that lies on one side of the liver and you want to cut it off without breaking because if you break it it will make bitter everything that it touches save whatever fat there is about the entrails and put it in the baking pan with the chicken the gizzard has been cut open from one side and the inside bag which contains gravel and straw taken out but a very much easier way to dress the gizzard instead of opening it is to cut away the bluish skin which lies on the outside on both sides without opening the gizzard at all and cut out that piece of flesh that is the only valuable portion of the gizzard if you dress the gizzard in this way when it is not already opened you save yourself a great deal of trouble for it is a very hard matter to open a gizzard like that and take away the bag which contains the gravel especially if the poultry has been frozen as the bag is apt to break and let out the gravel use the gizzard and liver for making gravy and the neck also cut out the oil sack or bag which lies at the back of the tail then the chicken is ready for stuffing in cutting off the feet cut them below the joint not just at the joint if you cut them just at the joint the skin and flesh will draw up in cooking but if you cut them just below the joint you will find that they do not draw up after cutting off the feet scrape the skin all round to make sure that there are no bits of feather or anything of that sort and wipe it with a wet towel and you have the chicken in readiness to stuff stuff it with any force meat that you like you remember this morning that we made force meat by chopping a teaspoonful of onion and frying it in a tablespoonful of butter then putting in with the fried onion a cupful of stale bread soaked in cold water seasoning with salt and pepper and sweet herbs i said also that you could add chopped meat cold meat or eggs or to make any desired addition to the force meat in the way of seasoning 
a little grated cheese and stuffing is very nice you scarcely will realize what the seasoning is i will use a little grated cheese this afternoon to make a force meat very like what i made this morning except in addition to the chopped onion fried in a tablespoonful of butter seasoned with salt and pepper i shall put in half a cupful of grated cheese you may like to know my way of chopping onion in the first place i make a lot of little cuts in one direction as far down as i think i shall need in order to get my teaspoonful then i make little cuts in the other direction and then by slicing it across you get your chopped onion a very nice addition to force meat is chestnuts either our ordinary american chestnut or french or italian chestnuts these are quite large i presume they are for sale at the fruit stores here our ordinary american chestnut is very good choose rather large chestnuts and either roast or boil them take off the husks and skins and thus use them to stuff the chicken with either simply using the chestnut seasoned with salt pepper and butter or if you have boiled or roasted and skinned them mix them with bread and seasoning then after having prepared the force meat you put it into the chicken sew it up and truss it into shape i will show you directly how to do that so as to keep the chicken plump and so that it does not in roasting spread apart i shall sew it with a trussing needle and a cord or you might accomplish the same purpose by using skewers putting the skewers just where i put the cords in sewing up a chicken after it is stuffed remember what i said this morning take large stitches with coarse cord so that you can easily see where to take the threads out when the chicken is done after the chicken is trussed if you are going to bake it put it into a pan without any water for the same reason that i gave you this morning the water will soak it half simmer it you do not need water to keep it from burning because the little drippings will soon come from the chicken brown it and then dredge it with flour and baste it every fifteen minutes or so bake it until it is tender and nicely brown the time of course depends upon the heat of the oven truss the chicken first pushing the legs as far up as you can towards the breast and run the trussing needle which is simply a long needle through so as to hold the legs fast then either bend the wings back in turning them or simply fold them together and secure them with the same string by drawing the string tight you keep the bird plump keep it drawn together and when the bird is done all you have to do is to take these two ends of string in one hand make one cut and pull the string out the liver the gizzard the heart the neck and the feet use in making gravy of course the gizzard liver and heart are all right as they are now prepared if you wish to add the feet you will scald them and scrape off the skin then cut off the ends of the claws and you have the feet perfectly clean put them with the gizzard liver and heart to boil as the basis of your gravy the french people always save all the feet of all kinds of poultry they prepare them in this way and put them into soups sometimes they cook them till the bones grow gelatinous till they are very soft and tender they dress them with sauce and serve them as what they call an entree or side dish they make a dish which is more delicate than pig's feet of course in a large kitchen where a great deal of poultry is used it is possible to make a very good sized dish of them fricasseed chicken i shall use this chicken for fricassee it has been singed picked and wiped with a wet towel first cut the skin down back of the neck and cut off the neck i shall talk about this chicken as if it was not drawn at all showing you how to cut it up and draw it at the same time cut off the neck and take out the crop as i showed you with the other chicken then cut off the wings taking a little of the breast with the wings find the joint where the wings join the body cut at that joint then instead of cutting the wing right off short take a little piece of the breast with it that gives you a nice piece then cut the wing in two and cut off the tip which is dry that you can cook in the fricassee or not as you please it flavors but there is very little meat on it the other part of the wing you want of course to use put the pieces of chicken on two plates putting the good pieces on one plate and the inferior pieces on the other having taken off the wing take off what is called the wing side bone then cut forward and break off the shoulder bone 
the idea is to cut the breast into several good-sized pieces cutting in this way you sacrifice what is called the merry thought or wishbone you either can cut off the side bone or not cut off the other wing in the same way then cut off the leg and second joint together instead of cutting the leg in two pieces at both joints cut it in three pieces that gives you two pieces of the second joint in cooking chicken for fricassee you want to have the pieces about one size so that they will cook easily then if they are one size they are much easier to help next to separate the breast from the backbone cut down through the ribs on each side if the chicken has not been drawn be careful with your knife not to cut into the entrails then you can take the breast off and if the chicken is not drawn all the entrails will be exposed and you can draw it with perfect ease the lungs of the chicken which are those light red organs on the side of the backbone are always used by the french in cookery not only those organs in chicken but in the larger carcasses of meat they are quite as much food as the heart or liver i am not in the habit of using them but they are quite as available after the breast has been taken off cut it up in several pieces first cut off the entire tip leaving that in one piece then cut the remainder in two or four pieces according to its size next cut the backbone there is a natural division in the upper part of the backbone that breaks there cut that off and trim off the ribs in cutting the lower part of the backbone instead of cutting it just in two making rather queer pieces to help cut off the upper part of it leaving it entire not splitting that part of it in that way cut off the portion called the oysters two little pieces of flesh in the upper part of the backbone that are considered very nice on one plate we have the inferior parts on the other the nice parts of the chicken being all cut in pieces of one size it is easy to help it cooks more evenly and is rather nicer than if you had it in two or three sizes part of the chicken i am going to make into a brown fricassee and part of it i am going to fry there would be thirteen pieces if we counted the two pieces of the backbone there are half a dozen of the poor pieces not counting the wing pieces or neck the question is asked whether the cords or sinews should be drawn from the legs you can do that with old poultry if you want to because those cords never get very tender it is not necessary to do it with medium tender poultry first brown the chicken using either some of the chicken fat or butter or salad oil for browning it now since the question of using salad oil in cooking has come up suppose i cook this chicken with salad oil so that you can taste it after all that is the best test you possibly can have as to whether you like salad oil in cooking i shall put in just salad oil enough to cover the bottom of the saucepan that is enough to prevent sticking for a chicken of three pounds take about three or four tablespoonfuls of salad oil just enough to cover the bottom of the saucepan first put the saucepan containing the salad oil over the fire and let it get hot then put in the chicken and brown it now can you notice the slightly aromatic odor that is the oil and directly you notice that odor and the oil begins to smoke it is hot enough as soon as the chicken is brown and you can brown it just as fast as you want to then put a heaping tablespoonful of flour over it some of the ladies will have seen the same process in making the brown stew of meat the other day and stir the chicken until the flour is brown when the flour is brown on the chicken and that will be by the time you get it well stirred up then add boiling water enough to cover it when the flour is brown among the chicken put in boiling water enough to cover it season it with pepper and salt palatably and let it cook until it is tender that will take from half an hour to two hours according to the toughness of the chicken remember the more slowly you cook it after it once begins to cook the nicer it will be cover up the saucepan after the fricassee is seasoned and cook it until it is tender in the cooking of chicken the gravy that you make by putting boiling water on seems to boil away and you may want to add a little more just keep enough gravy over it to cover it and when it is tender it is ready to serve the odor you notice now is the aromatic odor of that salad oil and is all that you will get in cooking with olive oil fried chickens 
next the fried chicken maryland style will be prepared we will fry the chicken and then i will tell you about hominy the southern cooks use lard for frying either lard entirely or half lard and half butter enough to cover the bottom of the frying pan about half an inch let the fat get hot put some flour on a plate season it with salt and pepper and roll the pieces of chicken in it when the fat is hot in the pan and the chicken has been rolled in the flour put it into the hot fat and fry it brown first on one side and then on the other of course tender chicken is generally used for this dish so that by the time it is fried brown it is done fry the chicken until it is tender and brown take up the chicken when it is brown put it on a hot dish in the frying pan where it was fried put enough cream to make a good gravy stirring it constantly you see there will be flour on the pan off the fried chicken that will thicken the gravy season the gravy with salt and pepper pour it over the chicken and serve it some of the colored cooks whom i have seen prepare this dish first dip their chicken in water before rolling it in the butter and flour that is for the purpose of making more flour stick to it but there is always this disadvantage if you do that there will be some particles of water remaining and when you put it in the hot fat it will sputter very much you can do that or not as you like while the chicken is being browned i will tell you how to prepare the hominy of course the chicken is to be seasoned with more pepper and salt if you wish in addition to what you put on in the first place with the flour hominy first pick the hominy over and wash it fine hominy is generally used for this dish put it over the fire in cold water a cupful of hominy to about four cupfuls of water boil it and stir it often enough to prevent sticking until it begins to be tender boil it for an hour until it begins to grow tender then place it where there is no danger of burning pour off the water or leave off the cover of the saucepan so that the water will evaporate the hominy will need to cook pretty nearly an hour and when it is done or nearly done it should be as thick as hasty pudding if you have a double boiler you can put in very much less water for there is no danger of burning i think you would need only about half or a little more than half as much water only take care to leave the cover off the kettle if you find that the hominy is going to be thinner than hasty pudding when it is nearly done if the hominy is used rather coarse about five minutes before it is done mix a tablespoonful of flour with just enough water or milk to make it a thin liquid and stir it into the hominy that will hold it together when it is cold so that it can be cut into slices in making hasty pudding you can put that tablespoonful of flour in to hold it together when it is cold you want to allow long enough for the flour to boil thoroughly before dishing the hominy when it is tender pour it into an earthen dish or shallow tin pan wet with cold water and let it get cold and hard always make this in advance of your fried chicken you want the hominy cold and solid so that you can cut it cut it in little cakes about an inch thick and two inches square these little cakes of hominy are to be fried either in the pan with the chicken or in another pan by the side of the chicken and served on a dish with the chicken fried fish i have here some fish which i shall fry we will not try broiled fish because this has been frozen we will do that some other day in frying fish use either indian meal or flour season with salt and pepper to roll the fish in fry the fish in lard or the drippings from salt pork in case you use salt pork fry it brown olive oil is one of the nicest fats for frying fish you may have your choice whether i fry with lard or oil we will fry in oil if you use lard at all you want it to be very nice in the frying pan i shall put about half an inch of oil that is less than half a cupful put it over the fire and let it get hot just as i did for the chicken this is frozen fish that has been thawed cut the fish in pieces about two inches square and roll them either in flour seasoned with pepper and salt or indian meal as i told you put them into the oil when the oil is hot as soon as the fish is browned nicely it will be done you can add more seasoning than there is in the flour use indian meal with pork it is particularly nice End of Lecture 6
Lecture 7 of A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Course of Lectures on the Principles of Domestic Economy and Cookery by Juliet Corson. Lecture 7. Our lesson this morning, ladies, will begin with pea soup with crusts. This soup I shall make with the addition of a little onion. You remember the other day we made pea soup perfectly plain. We shall cook salt codfish stewed in cream, venison with currant jelly, stewed carrots, and cabinet pudding. First the peas will be put on the fire to boil, and I shall begin to make the pudding. Cabinet Pudding The cabinet pudding, as I shall make it today, will be rather elaborate. You can make it more plainly. It is made of cake, sponge cake is the best, French candied fruit, eggs, and milk, so that first... I shall give you the recipe for the pudding as I make it today, and then I will give you the recipe for the plainer form. For the pudding, use a pudding mold of the size I have in my hand, holding about a quart, about half a pound of French candied fruit, which you can get at the confectionaries here. I have today candied cherries, a little candied pear, a green lime candied, a small orange, and an apricot. I shall also use a very little citron, about an ounce of citron. That I want simply for the effect of the green part of the citron. Put the citron in the form of small leaves. The large fruits cut in slices, which you may leave round or cut in the form of stars or to imitate a flower bud. After you have cut the fruit, butter a perfectly plain tin pudding mold thickly with cold butter, quite thickly. Have the butter cold. Lay the fruit against the mold in the form of a wreath, or a star, or any fanciful form you like, some on the bottom of the mold and some on the sides. The cold butter will hold the fruit in place. After part of the fruit has been laid against the sides and bottom of the mold, then cut the sponge cake in large slices about half an inch thick. One slice the size and shape of the bottom of the mold, and either one long slice that will go round the sides of the mold inside, or two or three pieces according to the size of your cake. Generally, in cities where there are confectionaries, you can buy sponge cake baked in large, thin sheets. You know the form in which it is used for the baker's charlotte russe. This is baked in large sheets. Cut it in small sheets and fit it into the molds. Because it is very thin, you can work with it very much better than you can work with that which is thicker. This will be very apt to break because it is very stiff. If you are to shape the cake to your mold, the cake should be perfectly soft and flexible. After the first layer of cake is put in the mold, then use the rest of the cake, cut in small pieces or broken, and put it into the mold in layers with the rest of the fruit. You see, first you use some of the fruit to ornament the inside of the mold, and then some of the cake to line the inside of the mold. That gives you what will be the outside of your pudding when it is done. Then, when the mold is decorated with fruit and lined with cake, put the rest of the cake and fruit into the mold in layers. Make a custard of a pint of milk and six eggs, because for this pudding the custard must be firm enough to hold the pudding in shape so that it can be turned out of the mold. Also, a quarter of a pound of sugar. That is about four heaping tablespoonfuls of sugar. After the crust is made, 
poured into the mould which you have filled with cake and fruit and let it stand so that all the custard may be absorbed by the cake when the custard has been entirely absorbed by the cake set the mould in the steamer or in the saucepan with water to reach two-thirds up the side of the mould put the cover of the steamer or saucepan and steam it until the custard is firm that will generally take about an hour and a half it may take a little longer but be quite sure that the custard is firm do not cook the custard first just mix it up in order to be sure that the custard is firm before you attempt to turn the pudding out you want to run a fork or a small knife down through the thickest part in the middle of the pudding move it backward and forward look into the pudding to make sure that the custard is done as long as the custard looks liquid at all you must keep on cooking when the pudding is done take the mould out of the steamer using a towel because the mould will be hot take a dish or a platter that fits just over the top of the mould have the inside of the platter the size of the top of the mould put the platter over the mould and turn it upside down then you will find that you can lift the mould from the pudding without any trouble and the pudding will remain there on the platter this pudding i shall serve with powdered sugar it is exceedingly rich it is not necessary to have a sauce with it because it is so rich but you can use if you wish any of the nice pudding sauces that i have told you of this is a pudding which in europe is served as the greatest luxury it takes its name cabinet pudding from the fact that it is served in the little rooms or cabinets that is the private rooms where special dinners or suppers are given in the european restaurants what is called cabinet pudding in the restaurants and hotels in this country is usually a nice bread pudding made with fruit and it is not decorated in this way trouble is not taken to decorate the mould it is simply a nice bread pudding made with custard with some raisins or currants in it that is what is called cabinet pudding in this country in the restaurants and hotels so you can make the memorandum that you can use instead of cake bread and instead of french fruit simply raisins currants and citron you can spend as much time and ingenuity decorating the pudding as you like but i have done this very quickly and very simply the pudding can be served hot or it can be cooled and then put on the ice and made very cold you notice that in filling the mould i press the cake down on the inside because as it is saturated with custard of course it would sink down you want to press the cake well down in the mould and have a layer of cake on top the last layer of cake question if you made it of bread wouldn't you have to use more sugar in it miss corson yes if you use bread you will have to use more sugar question do you have any salt in it miss corson you don't need to put any salt in it you can if you want to there is no necessity for it because there will be salt both in your bread and in your cake question do you flavor the custard miss corson no just the plainest custard you will find that the french fruit will give the custard all the flavor you require you will find that if you put the custard into a pitcher after it is made you can pour it into the pudding very much more readily than if you try to pour it from the bowl either pour it into a pitcher or use a cup because you will have to pour it slowly in order to let it thoroughly absorb pea soup with crusts next take the recipe for pea soup some of the ladies who were at the monday afternoon lesson will need only to make one or two notes and the others will take the full recipe four peas soup four quarts use a cupful of dried peas yellow split peas pick them over wash them in cold water put them over the fire in two quarts of cold water and let them heat slowly 
As the water heats, it softens the peas. When it is boiling, add half a cupful more of cold water and let that heat. Then add more cold water. Continue to add cold water half a cupful at a time until you have used two quarts more of cold water in addition to the first two quarts. The object of adding cold water slowly is to soften the peas. By reducing the heat of the water and then gradually increasing it again, you soften the peas so that you can cook them in from an hour and a half to two hours. Boil them very slowly without the addition of salt until they are soft enough to rub through a sieve with a potato masher. After they are rubbed through the sieve, put them again into the soup kettle with a tablespoonful of butter and a tablespoonful of flour rubbed to a smooth paste. Stir the soup over the fire until the butter and flour are entirely dissolved. Then season the soup palatably with salt and pepper and let it boil for two or three minutes. While it is boiling, cut two slices of stale bread. Baker's bread is the best, or very light homemade bread, in little dice about half an inch square. Put a couple of tablespoonfuls of butter in a frying pan over the fire and let the butter begin to brown. Then throw the dice of stale bread into the butter and stir the bread until it is brown. Take it out of the butter with a skimmer, if it has not absorbed all the butter, and lay it for a moment on brown paper and then put it on a hot dish to send it to the table with the soup. Do not put the bread into the soup unless you are going to serve at once, because it will soften a little, but you will find that fried bread will soften less quickly than toasted bread. A great many people put small squares of toast in the pea soup, but that softens at once. If you have a frying kettle, which you use for doughnuts or fritters or anything of that sort, partly full of frying fat, you can heat it and fry the bread in that instead of frying it with the butter in the frying pan. Have the fat smoking hot. The bread browns very quickly. Take it out on a skimmer and lay it on a brown paper for a moment. Then it is ready for the soup. These little fried crusts of bread are called croutons or crusts in the cookery books. I am going to add an onion fried in butter to the soup today. Put that in if you use it when you first begin to cook the soup. One onion, peeled, sliced and fried light brown in a tablespoonful of butter. You could also use the bones from ham, cold roast ham, cold boiled ham or the bones of beef, either raw or cooked, in the place of the onion or in addition to the onion, as you like. Remember, all those things give distinct flavors to the pea soup. If you put any kind of bones in, put them in with the peas at the beginning and boil them with the peas. Salt codfish stewed in cream. Next, take the recipe for salt codfish stewed in cream. First, to freshen salt codfish. That, of course, is always the first thing you do with salt codfish, no matter how you finish. You can do that by soaking it overnight in cold water. If it has any skin on it, be sure to have the skin side up. If you put it in the water with the skin side down, the salt which soaks out of the fiber of the fish simply falls against the skin and stays there. The fish does not get any fresher. A great deal of codfish in these days is sent to the market without either skin or bone. Supposing we have the regulation dried codfish, we skin and bone it, then soak it overnight in cold water, and next morning put it over the fire in more cold water, plenty of it, and put the kettle or pan containing the fish and the cold water on the back part of the stove where it will heat very gradually. Do not let it boil at all, but keep it at scalding heat. Do not more than let it simmer. The effect of the boiling on any salted fiber, whether it is fish or meat, is simply to harden it. Keep it at a scalding heat until the fish is tender. Of course, that will depend upon the dryness of the fish. It may take a half hour, it may take an hour. That is one way to freshen fish. 
Another way, the way I am doing now, is accomplished more quickly by putting the fish over the fire in plenty of cold water, enough to cover it. Set it on the stove where it will heat gradually. When the water is nearly hot on the fish, pour it off and put more cold water on. Let that get scalding hot. Do not let it boil at all. Simply let it get scalding hot, that is, let the steam begin to rise from it. Change the water as often as it gets scalding hot until the fish is tender. If you are careful to change the water often enough, that is, if you do not let it begin to boil, probably the fish will be tender in half an hour, from half to three quarters of an hour. The time will depend upon the dryness of the fiber of the fish. Generally, in about half an hour, it will be tender. As soon as the fish is tender, drain it, and then it is ready to dress in any way you wish to use it. Today I shall make a little cream sauce and heat the fish in it. That will be codfish stewed in cream sauce. Boiled codfish you would serve with boiled potatoes, and white sauce is made either with water or milk and hard-boiled eggs. That is the old New England saltfish dinner. Usually, with a salt codfish dinner, there are boiled parsnips and sometimes boiled beets, and it is very nice if you like codfish. For codfish hash, the old-fashioned codfish hash, use simply boiled codfish torn apart, forked in little fine flakes, or chopped in fine flakes. Of course, all the skin and bone is taken off. Mixed with an equal quantity of boiled potatoes, either mashed or chopped fine, palatably seasoned with pepper. Of course, the fish would be salt enough, usually. For a pint bowlful of fish and potatoes, use a tablespoonful of butter. The fish and potatoes are thoroughly mixed, then put into a frying pan with just enough butter or drippings to keep it from burning. You may put, for the quantity I have given you, a heaping tablespoonful of butter in the frying pan and let it melt. Then put in the fish and continue stirring it. Remember, there is some butter in the hash already, and that will melt with the heat and probably be enough. But if you need more to prevent its burning, add a tablespoonful. Stir the hash until it is scalding hot. Then push it to one side of the frying pan with the knife you are stirring with, and form it into a little oval cake at one side of the frying pan. When the hash is thoroughly hot, then the butter will begin to fry out of it, and there probably will be butter enough to prevent its burning. Let it stand in the little cake at the side of the pan until it is browned on the bottom. You want to watch it a little, and now and then run a knife under it and loosen it from the pan to make sure that it is not burning. Then, when the bottom is browned, hold a plate in one hand and the frying pan in the other and turn the fish out on the plate or dish. Codfish Cakes To make codfish cakes, first make the fish fine. After freshening it and taking off the skin and bone, chop it or tear it in fine flakes. Mix it with an equal quantity of potato, either mashed or chopped. Mashed potato is rather better for codfish cakes because you can pack it a little more closely in the form of cakes. To a pint bowlful of codfish hash, add a tablespoonful of butter, a palatable seasoning of pepper, and the yolk of one raw egg. That is, half codfish, half potato, a tablespoonful of butter, and the yolk of one raw egg, and a palatable seasoning of pepper. Then dust your hands with dry flour. Take a tablespoonful of this mixture up in your hand, and either form it in the shape of a round ball or flat cake, as you like. Have ready a frying kettle or deep frying pan with enough fat or drippings or lard in it to cover three or four of the codfish cakes or balls when you drop them into it, so that if you use a frying pan, you must have a deep frying pan. You may make it, in that case, codfish cakes, not balls. If you have a frying kettle, you can make little round balls. When the fat is smoking hot, Drop the codfish cakes or balls into it and fry them just a golden brown, light brown. Take them out of the fat with a skimmer and lay them on brown paper for a moment to free them from grease, then serve them hot. You will notice that I always tell you, 
in frying everything to take it out of the fat and lay it for a moment on brown paper because then you are sure to free it from grease not necessarily very coarse paper just ordinary brown wrapping paper I do not mean manila paper, but the common brown wrapping paper that comes around groceries and meat that tradesmen generally use. The paper must be porous so that the grease will be easily absorbed. This is the only point you have to remember. The usual way of frying codfish cakes is simply to put fat enough in the pan to keep them from sticking, and in that way they are not browned all over, that is, they are not browned on the sides. They are simply brown on the top and on the bottom, and the fat has, of course, generally soaked into them so that you get them thoroughly greasy, unless you have fat enough to cover them and have the fat smoking hot when you put them in. In frying it is very easy to use the fat repeatedly if you only remember one thing. The fat you fry fish in, you want to keep always for fish. Then you can fry anything else, meat, chicken, fritters, or doughnuts, in the other fat. Generally, keep two jars or crocks of fat, and take care only to let the fat get smoking hot in frying, and as soon as you have done frying, set the kettle off the stove so that the fat does not burn. Let it cool a very little, then strain it through a cloth into an earthen bowl and let it get cold. Wash the frying kettle out and clean it thoroughly, and then you can put the fat back in it, and it will be ready for the next time if you use a porcelain lined kettle. If you use a metal kettle for frying, tin, or anything of that sort, do not put the fat in it till you are ready to use it again, because it might rust a little. If you strain it through an ordinarily thick towel, there will be no sediment. If you strain it through a sieve, there will be a little sediment that will settle to the bottom of the fat, and you can turn the cake of fat out of the bowl when it is cold and scrape that off. The best way is to strain through a cloth in the first place. If you are careful with the fat, you can use it repeatedly, use it a dozen times or more, until it is nearly used up. But if you are careless and let it burn, of course you very soon get it so dark in color that it colors anything directly you put it in before it is cooked and it has a burnt taste. But if you use it at the heat I tell you, just smoking hot, and do not let it burn, you can use it repeatedly. Sometimes you can lift it out in one solid cake when it is cold. Sometimes you will have to break it and take it off in more than one piece. On the bottom of the cake you will find a little brownish sediment which you must scrape off. Then you have the fat clarified and ready for use. For ordinary frying purposes the straining through the towel will answer. An earthen bowl is the best for keeping the fat in the kitchen, very much better than metal of any kind. Stewed Carrots Next take the recipe for stewed carrots. Carrots peeled as many as you wish to make a dishful. Cut them in rather small slices, a quarter of an inch thick. Put them over the fire in salted boiling water, enough to cover them. Boil them steadily until they are tender. That will be in perhaps half or three quarters of an hour. If the carrots are young and fresh, they will boil in half an hour. Longer as the season advances and the carrots grow denser in their fiber. Late in the winter, it may take an hour or even an hour and a half if they are very large and woody. Boil them until they are tender. Then drain them and throw them into plenty of cold water and let them get thoroughly cold. While they are cooling, make a sauce of water or of milk, as you like. If you have an ordinary vegetable dish full of carrots, you want about a pint of sauce. In that case, you will make the sauce as I have told you several times a tablespoonful of butter, and a tablespoonful of flour for a pint of sauce. Melt the butter and flour together over the fire, stirring them constantly until they bubble and are smoothly mixed. Then begin to add half a cupful at a time the milk or water that you are going to use in making the sauce. Stir each half cupful in, smooth, before you add any more water. If the milk or water is hot, of course, the sauce will be cooked all the more quickly. Let the sauce boil for a minute, stirring all the time. Then season with a level teaspoonful of salt for a pint of sauce, a quarter of a salt spoonful of pepper, remembering what I have said about using white pepper. 
drain the carrots from the cold water and put them into the sauce to heat while they are heating and that will only take three or four minutes chop a tablespoonful of parsley fine and stir it among the carrots then serve them as soon as they are hot you may make the addition of parsley or not as you like but it is very nice in some seasons of the year you cannot have the parsley if you have not the parsley and have made the sauce of water you will improve the dish very much if you stir the yolk of a raw egg into the sauce and carrots when you take them off the fire just before you dish them i will do that today i will make a sauce of water and add the yolk of an egg you had better put two or three tablespoons of sauce into a cup with the egg and mix it and then pour that into the sauce and stir well in chopping parsley use just the leaves not the stalks put them in the chopping bowl and chop them fine if you chop on a board steady the point of the knife with one hand and use an up and down motion with the other hand of course you can understand that using a long knife in chopping you can chop very much more quickly than you could in a chopping bowl where you can only get a circular cut one of the ladies asks me the object of putting the carrots in cold water they are put first in boiling salted water to set their color the action of the salt in the boiling water slightly hardens the surface so that the color does not boil out then if you take them at the point where they are tender you check the boiling at once by the cold water and secure the color entirely of course you will understand that by draining them and throwing them into cold water you check the heat at once if you simply let them stand in the water and gradually soften and soak letting the water keep warm you would soak the color out that follows with all boiled vegetables where we want to preserve the color this is the simplest and easiest way to do it question can the color of beets be preserved in the way you speak of miss corson no beets have to be boiled differently from any other vegetable if you break the skin of beets or cut them in any way the color escapes in the water so that to prepare the beets for boiling wash them very carefully without breaking the skin do not cut off the roots or the tops of the beets close leave some of the roots and three or four inches of the stalk do not trim them off close because if you cut the roots or stalks close to the beet you make a cut whence the color can escape wash them very carefully without breaking the skin put them over the fire in boiling water you do not need to salt it in fact it's better not to salt it boil them until they grow tender to the touch if you puncture the beet with a fork or a knife to try it you let the color out but you can take one of the beets up on a skimmer and use a thick towel and hold it in your hand and squeeze it to see if it is growing soft do not break the skin always remember that when the beet is tender you will find that it will yield a little between your fingers and the length of time required for cooking them will be from about half an hour to two hours and a half perhaps even longer than that young tender juicy beets may be cooked in half an hour the older they are the later it is in the season the harder the woody fiber will be and the longer it will take to cook them after they are cooked really tender then throw them into a bowl of cold water and rub off the skin with a wet towel do not leave them soaking in cold water venison with currant jelly take the recipe for venison now ladies enough butter to cover the bottom of the pan about a quarter of an inch let it get smoking hot then put in the venison you must have the pan large enough to hold the venison as soon as the venison is brown on one side turn it and brown it on the other brown it very fast as soon as the venison is browned put with it the currant jelly for every pound of venison use two tablespoonfuls of currant jelly not heaping spoonfuls or you might put one heaping tablespoonful for every pound of venison as soon as the venison is brown put the currant jelly in with it put the pan back where it will not be too hot and finish cooking the venison until it is done to suit your taste it will cook if it is an inch thick pretty well done in about twenty minutes season it with salt and pepper and when it is done put it on the platter and pour the currant jelly and butter over it the cooking of the jelly with the venison makes it a nice sauce or gravy question 
Wouldn't this be a nice way to cook buffalo or any other kind of game? Miss Corson, yes, it is a very good way. End of Lecture 7th Recording by Elizabeth in France